I like to start my presentation with a little quiz. Maybe you have seen it shortly when it was up there. Um, but does anybody know who this guy is? Anybody here in the audience know, know him? Looks a little bit like George Clooney. And he is, um, but it's not George Clooney. He's from the movie industry. He's not an actor. Who of you knows Reed Hastings? Reed Hastings. Yeah, Reed Hastings is the founder and CEO of company Netflix. And what's interesting about Netflix is not only that they make $2 billion revenue, but they have traditionally delivered most of their content on DVDs with the postal service. And that has changed rapidly in the, in the last year. So today, most of their users, or a large part of the users, are already streaming the movies through various devices. Netflix is really investing heavily into cross-platform technology. And in fact, they have now their content available on over 400 different devices, on web browsers, on set-top boxes, on televisions, mobile phones, tablets, and video game consoles. And not only can you browse the Netflix movie selection, you can even stream the movies through these devices. And what they do is they custom tailor the user interface to each of the devices, but at the same time, the underlying technology is shared code. 70% of the code is shared code and frameworks, and most of it is HTML5 based. So Netflix is a great example of how cross-platform, multi-platform technology can have a big impact on your business. And today I'm going to talk about cross-platform strategies for our industry, for the games industry, and how that impacts the future of our industry. So what role does cross-platform play in the games industry? How important is it? I'm not a fortune teller, but what I will share with you today are five major trends that we believe are shaping our industry in the next month. And the first of these trends is still kind of a secret. Not many people talk about this. Have you heard about the term gamograph? Or who of you has heard it, gamograph? We all know what the, what the social graph is, right? That's all the information that Facebook has and social networks have about people, like what they eat, what they like, what relationship they're in. I think Facebook even knows when my girlfriend breaks up with me before I know about it. So all that data about people's lives, that's a social graph. And just like there's this metadata about social activities, there is also metadata about people's gaming activities, what games they play, what games they like, what scores they achieved in which games, who they played against with, and what upgrades they bought. That data I, li I like to call the gamograph. And that is quite valuable data. The, the first trend is the rise of the gamograph. The screenshot here, that's from OpenFaint, which is a company that have invested in technology around the gamograph for mobile. And uh, yesterday on the panel with Ding Takashi, there was somebody from uh, OpenFaint, and he said they have now 100 million users that are connected through the gamograph data. And that is valuable because the Japanese company agree that they acquired OpenFaint for over $100 million. And Apple has built the game center. Why did they do that? Because they collect tons of metadata about the game activity of people, and it allows you to target consumers better and to leverage game discovery and make better game recommendations. That's why the gamograph is valuable because you can use it as a distribution and marketing tool. That's why more and more companies will try to own a part of this metadata, the gamograph. That's, that's the first trend that we're seeing. The second trend is a series of disruptions that are happening in the monetization infrastructure in our industry. 20 days ago, on the 1st uh, of July, that was a key day for Facebook because um, Facebook credits became the single currency. And Facebook credits is an example of a meta currency, of a currency system. And why did they do that? Because it allows them to lock in users. Once they buy that currency, they have to come back to their platform to spend it, and you can only spend it on their platform. It's a very powerful tool. That's why also Zynga have created their own meta currency, Zcoins. And you can earn Zcoins 
throughout the Zynga games, and then you can spend it on their own platform reward will. And it's even off Facebook. So they not only do they lock in their users with that currency, they also get users off Facebook and bring them to their own destination site and create their own user base, which is very valuable. So what we're seeing is more and more companies trying to create their own meta currencies as a retention tool and a way to lock in users. Another example for disruption that's happening in a positive way are video ads. We've seen a lot of innovation in, in video ads in the last month, and it's really like a boom of, of video ads as a monetization tool. Our company, we have increased our social game revenues by over 30% just by using better uh, monetization through video ads in, in the recent months. There has also been negative disruptions, like policy changes um, in the monetization infrastructure, which ha have driven entire companies out of business overnight. But also, companies can thrive from these disruptions. So it's important to follow closely and, and uh, react whenever these happen. The third trend that we're seeing is social games moving off social networks. So if you look at the, um, the history of the casual games industry, there were these big eras, like the era of retail games and console games, and then came the era of downloadable games. And then 2009, you had the era of games on social networks. And what we're seeing recently is that these games are moving off the social networks on their own platforms. And the reason is that initially people thought, OK, social games are games that are on social networks. But that's not really true. It's what makes the game social is more the social gameplay. And you can leverage that also on your own platform by using a social graph and, and building in social features. So we see more and more companies that take social games and put them on their own platform, like this example here. Who, who of you has played or knows Farmerama? Uh, it's a, OK, one, one person. It's a game from Big Point, And they have, it's a, it's a social farm game which they put on their own platform, farmerama.com. And I just heard yesterday they hit 30 million installs with that game. And they have 700,000 concurrent users playing that game So in, in peak time. So that's not daily active users. That's people at the same time, 700,000 people who play that game on their own platform. And that is, of course, a big advantage because you don't pay any commission to Facebook or to Apple. And you can control the whole monetization funnel much better. That's why monetization on your own platform can be significantly higher than on social networks. So that's the, the third trend. The fourth trend that we see is an evolution of cross-marketing. We all know that acquisition cost has been going up. I think uh, CPC has doubled uh, since last year. And royalty has really been cut. So the number one metric right now is retention. And it's all about keeping your users within your network and moving them from your game to another game. And a great way to do this is cross-marketing. And what we're seeing more and more is smarter ways, deeper ways of cross-marketing, not just putting a banner at and say, OK, play this game, but very deeply integrated into the gameplay. Like in this example here from Zynga, where they have in Frontier World, they have a quest where you can win, when you complete the quest, a knife, a virtual item, for another game, for Mafia Wars. So that is very deeply integrated, those two games. And what we see is that conversion rates can be more than twice as high if you do integrated cross-marketing versus just plain click marketing. So we're seeing more and more companies doing this cross-app, cross-platform, even cross-company with services like, like Amplifier, where you try to keep users and move them from your property to another property. And the fifth trend that I think is the most important one is the rise of mobile gaming. Facebook has already 250 million users using it on mobile devices. I think it's 100 million daily active users that use Facebook on iPhone, on Android, and on BlackBerry. And they say that the major part of their traffic at some point will be mobile. So more and more gaming will be happening on, on these devices, on smartphones in the future. And this is an example here on, on the screenshot. Who knows what company or what, what site that is on the screenshot? It's um, Mobagi Town, a Japanese mobile platform. And the company behind it, DNA, 
they make $1.3 billion revenue every year, have over $5 billion market valuation. And that the, these are the guys that bought NGMoco for $400 million. So there's a lot of companies in Asia with very high market valuations that not many people here are aware of that are very big in the mobile space, and now they're moving to the United States, to Europe, and going out of the mobile space, entering other platforms. So we have to watch out because Asian companies are two to three years ahead of us in terms of learnings, in terms of development. This is a slide from Morgan Stanley where they show the traffic distribution on the Mixi mobile, uh, on, on the Mixi social network in Japan. And the blue is their web traffic and yellow is mobile traffic. And you can see on the very right, the bar on the very right is Q3 2009. So almost two years ago, they already had 72% of their traffic on mobile. And today, I think 98% of social networking in Japan is already mobile. If we put all these five trends together, so the rise of GameoGraph as metadata, disruptions in monetization, creation of meta currencies, social games moving off social networks to their own platforms, evolution of cross-marketing, and the rise of mobile gaming. What does that mean for our strategy? Well, the way we see this, on the top axis, you have two ways you can access, your users can access your games. So you can, they can access them through desktops uh, on the web or through mobile devices. And there again, you have various sub-platforms like iOS, Android, WebOS, um, and more and more also HTML5 based browser uh, in, the, in the mobile browser. And then on this axis, you have three major distribution channels. So on the bottom, you have big portals like the App Store from Apple or uh, game platforms like Pogo. Then in the middle, you have the social networks. And on top, you have companies that have created their own destination websites like our company, GameDwell. In the, in the old world, these were six separate segments, very much separated, and there were companies that dominated one segment, like Zynga dominating uh, social network gaming. What we're seeing in the future is that this all becomes a connected world. It's going to be connected through the gamograph, through meta currencies, and through cross-platform marketing. And that has big implications because when Two years ago, the social networks were still in open space and, uh, and the big land grab was happening. Zynga was not the first one to be on that market, but they were the first one to scale on that market. So being the first to scale has given them tremendous uh, competitive advantage now. That I think they're as big as the 15 next companies combined. And what's inter interesting is that on the cross-platform game, there is no company yet that has reached that critical scale. So What's happening right now is that that land grab for becoming the first company of scale in the cross-platform game is happening right now. It will be interesting to see which company that will be. What I can share with you is some of our strategies for cross-platform of my company, GameDuel. So we started out eight years ago as a web game company where we have our own platform, GameDuel.com. We developed 60 games for that platform. And that is still our main um, platform where we have, across our network, we have 70 million users. Then uh, two years ago, we started to expand and also create social games, mainly on Facebook. We have now 10 larger apps on Facebook. And last year, we also expanded into mobile. We have six native apps on various mobile devices, iPhone, Android, WebOS. And we're all connecting it right now through a shared gamograph, through shared social graph, through cross-promotion, very deeply integrated cross-promotion, and through uh, meta currency and our game brands. And the interesting thing is that it varies across channel in terms of acquisition and in terms of monetization. In terms of user acquisition, we see that social is still the best channel. Mobile is quite difficult to become one of the top games because it depends heavily on how Apple is featuring you. We were lucky to have two of our games featured by Apple because they liked our innovative uh, features, but it's much more difficult, especially since paid installs marketing has been banned. 
On Android, it's, uh, it's a bit easier. So we see differences in user acquisition across the channels. And if you're only on one channel, then you have a disadvantage compared to companies that are, can leverage various channels and buy users cheaper on one channel and then funnel them to another channel where they may have higher monetization. And that's exactly the case. Monetization is also different across the channels. So we're seeing the lowest monetization on social networks of these three. Um, I think now you can officially see the, the data from Zynga, from their IPO filings. Um, I think it's four cents per day per DAU that they have on average uh, as, a, uh, as an ARPU on their games. And typically, 2% of users on social are paying users. We see higher numbers on mobile. And there we see up to 10% of users that are paying. And the highest revenue we see on our own website. And that's why we have an advantage of moving users through the loop and then monetizing them on our own platform. Here's an example from one of our games, Bubble Pop, that we have on all three platforms. And we started on the web platform. Then we expanded into social, where we cut the gameplay to down to a minute, because people on social networks like to play these kind of games in shorter intervals. And then for mobile, we changed completely the way users can uh, control the game. They can now swipe with their finger like a slingshot and shoot, shoot the bubbles. And we see big differences in terms of monetization across the platforms. Here's another example, one of our games, uh, card game, Cleopatra's Pyramid, which we also have on, on all platforms. On Facebook, we have a monetization model where, we, where users can buy booths, virtual uh, booths like extra time and extra cards. And on mobile, we give it away for free, and then we sell premium content. So the freemium model, which we see now more and more developers using, I think it's 70% now that, that use the freemium model. And interestingly, we tested different monetization models. The first one we had, you could buy directly the level upgrades uh, in the game and start at 99 cents to 199. You can buy a level pack. And then um, what we split tested was that you buy a virtual currency in, in the form of these scarabs. You buy these scarabs, and then with them, you can buy the level upgrades. And interestingly, that monetized better than the direct model. So that already hints to what I believe is the most important success driver doing all these tests for, for games companies. Um, I, th I like to call it the, the Z factor. And a good example is, is this company, Zara. It's a, European, it's a Spanish textile company that is the largest retailer in Europe for clothing. And they have been founded in the 1970s and perfected what they call analytics-driven design and production. So they split test everything. They, they do analyze all the data in real time in their stores. When somebody buys an item like a pullover or jeans, they have the real time data. And then they analyze what cuts work best, what materials work best, what sizes work best, and then have that in the stores based on the consumer response. The typical cycle in the fashion industry is six months. Zara has a cycle of four weeks from new design until it's in the shop. and when the items don't sell for a few days, then they immediately take them out and replace them with new designs and test new things. So what Zara has perfected in the fashion industry, Zynga has perfected in the games industry. And somebody at a Games Beat called Zynga, he said, Zynga is not really a games company, they're a business intelligence company. The same thing is true for Netflix. They are really testing everything on their different platforms. They call it um, sell, so they take uh, user groups and then test different flows and features, and then out based on that, look who is watching the most movies and staying subscribed the longest, and then they adapt the platforms according to that. That is what I believe also one of the biggest advantages of being a cross-platform company, because the speed of testing and the cost of testing is varying significantly across channels. On iPhone, it's very hard to test, because every time you change something, you have to go through the approval process by Apple. And also, marketing tracking is very limited. Um, Android is much easier to test, and also on social, it's much faster to test than on, on the web. That's why if you're a cross-platform company, you can outsmart your competitors by having faster learning cycles and having, as a result, the better product. And I'd like to close with, with, a, with this photo. Um, this is taken at a recent networking dinner at the White House, where President 
Obama invited the top people from Silicon Valley for a networking event. And there's uh, CEOs of Yahoo and Twitter, and there's also Eric Schmidt from Google and uh, Steve Jobs on the right. Uh, there's Mark Zuckerberg. And also here, Reed Hastings from Netflix was, was there. So what these companies have in common, they have all understood the importance and the potential of cross-platform and are investing heavily into that technology. And my prediction is that if they do another dinner like that next year, there might be a new face sitting at that table. And that could be somebody from the company that first manages to bring to scale the cross-platform game and be the first one there. All right, with that, thank you very much.